Even though they're not getting IV chemotherapy, they still have a cancer diagnosis, and that can still be very scary and unsettling. And I think sometimes, you know, you think, oh, these are just bladder patients. It's different, but it might not be different. Again, they still have a cancer diagnosis. This is still going to be a very fearful and unsettling time for that patient and their caregivers. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing, from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Weimer, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we're talking with Tiffany Kurtz, Manager of Outpatient Oncology at Summa Health Cancer Institute in Akron, Ohio, about intravesical administration. As a reminder, you can earn free NCPD contact hours after listening to this episode and completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. So to start today, let's just talk a little bit and have you briefly explain what intervesical administration is and how it's different from what we're all more familiar with, I'm sure, which is IV administration. So intravenous or IV administration of medications is what most people would think of when you think of cancer treatments. And that's true. Most treatments are delivered via IV or even orally in pill form. These types of treatments are systemic. They enter the body through the blood and circulate throughout the body. And depending on the specific drug, the patient could have side effects that are of a systemic nature, affecting different body systems, like the most well-known would be your GI symptoms or hair loss. Intravesical administration, on the other hand, is a localized or regional treatment. It's only going to affect the area of the body that the medication comes in contact with. So consequently, because it is administered in the bladder, the common side effects that we're going to see will be localized to the bladder. I also want to point out that intravesical administration may be called different things in different places or by different institutions. I've seen it called intravesicular administration most commonly. And at my institution, we call it bladder installation because that's just way easier to say and makes more sense. Now, I have heard patients, and I even have a family member on my husband's side, call it a bladder wash. Now, I do not love when patients or people call it a bladder wash because I think that's confusing. It makes me think like, oh, they're putting water up in my bladder and cleaning it out. And that's not the case, but I have heard people call it a wash. It's intravesical or intravesicular potentially, but I like to call it bladder installation. So how it actually works. So intravesical administration, the medication is administered directly into the bladder. So you have to use a catheter. So a urinary catheter is inserted using sterile technique. So you can use a straight cath or an indwelling catheter, like a Foley catheter. The urine is drained out of the bladder. The catheter is then clamped. If you're using an indwelling catheter system, the medication is administered either by a bag or a syringe and then usually followed by a small flush with like a 10 ml normal saline flush to clear the line. The patient is then instructed to roll. So they're gonna go like side to side, onto their back, even onto their front if they can, so that the medication coats all surfaces of the bladder. So, you know, imagine that patient rolling in the bed and that's the medication is now coating the bladder. The patient changes this position like every 13 or every 15 to 30 minutes and they hold the medication in for up to two hours, ideally. If the patient stays at the infusion center to do the turning, the catheter usually remains in place and clamped, and after the two hours, the bladder is drained. The catheter is then removed, and the patient is discharged home. At my institution, the medication comes in a syringe prepared by pharmacy. It has a closed system transfer device attached to it, and it's administered via the side port on the indwelling urinary catheter. And it's given slowly, like similar to an IV push through the side port of that urinary catheter. And then we do have some patients who prefer to do the two hour of turns at home. So after the medication is instilled, the catheter is removed and the patient is discharged home. 
Of course, the nurse would want to assess and make sure that that patient can hold the medication in the bladder and make it home in time. So if someone has to drive like an hour away from the hospital, they might not be a good candidate to send home to do their turning because you want to make sure that, you know, they're going to make it home safely and without having any leakage or accidents. So at my institution, the urologist writes an order that it's up to the nurse discretion and patient preference if they need to stay at the infusion center or if they can tolerate going home to perform the turning to coat the bladder at home. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tiffany. That was a really great explanation in in the highlights of how this therapy is administered. So let's talk a little bit more. What are the types of cancer diagnoses that are treated using intravesical administration? Intravesical administration of anti-cancer drugs. So they're typically used to treat early stage, superficial, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So the cancer is still in or very close to the inner lining of the bladder. Typically, this is for a carcinoma in situ or stage one bladder cancer. Also, this intravesical therapy is often used after a surgical procedure called transurethral resection of bladder tumor or TERP. Great. Thank you. What are the most common agents that we see administered via the intravesical route? So these patients, they're going to get one of two main types of intravesical treatment. So there's immunotherapy and there's chemotherapy. So immunotherapy prompts the body's own immune system to attack cancer cells. And many oncology nurses would be familiar with this because of all the different IV immunotherapies we're giving now. So the most common is Bacillus common urine or BCG is the initials, and so much easier to say. Right. (laughs) That's the most common intravesical immunotherapy for treating this early stage bladder cancer and is a treatment of choice. And that's the treatment of choice at my institution. So BCG, it's a live attenuated, which means weakened, tuberculosis bacterium or TB made from a type of mycobacterium bovis. So it is a live weakened TB bacteria which seems like crazy to think about. And it's like, where did they come up with this? And I didn't research that any further there. But that's the most common. And that's what we see for the most part and what the physicians are ordering for these patients. So BCG, it is a biologic response modifier, which triggers the immune system to indirectly affect the tumor. So it is thought that BCG brings an immune response to the bladder by causing an inflammatory process in the bladder. Then the second type is chemotherapy. And as oncology nurses know, chemotherapy directly attacks actively growing cancer cells in the bladder. So the most common drugs that I've seen is gemcitabine and taxotere. Also have seen mitomycin, and then there's other drugs out there as well, but these are the most commonly used ones. So even though BCG seems to be the most common used and the treatment of choice, my institution saw a huge uptick in the use of chemotherapy for bladder installations instead of BCG several years ago, there was a national shortage of BCG. It went on allocation. We were only getting so many vials at a time, definitely not enough to keep up with the demand. So the physicians and pharmacists, they had to get creative and they would order to split the doses that we would give patients, like one third of the dose, and then they could share the vial between three patients. So we'd schedule three patients to come in about the same time. Pharmacy would prepare it by using that vial, but splitting it out for three different patients, just what we had to do to get by. And then sometimes BCG wasn't available at all for our patients. And so the urologist would start to order gemcitabine and taxotere. We are still seeing that now. At my institution, the BCG shortage is better. It's definitely not completely gone. I checked in with pharmacy the other day and they said it's hit or miss. You know, we can get BCG and other times it's on back order. So we have to work really closely with nursing and pharmacy and the urology offices that are ordering these treatments to make sure we have enough drug for the patients. Can they get BCG? Do they need to get the chemotherapy instead? You know, what's going to be best for that patient's treatment? So it gets a little complicated, but luckily it's getting better. And then I wanted to mention, so when it comes to this treatment regimen and these bladder installations, typically these drugs are first given weekly for six weeks in an induction phase. And then sometimes they go on a maintenance phase. They might get it weekly times three weeks, about every three months, or we've seen it, they get it about once a month for a year. And treatment could continue up to three years for some patients. 
but the exact frequency will vary patient to patient. That's so interesting of just the variance and the way that that frequency can change depending on what the patient's needs are. And I think your comments about the drug shortage is an unfortunate reality. I feel like we live in now in oncology drugs. It seems kind of ridiculous and impossible and just unacceptable, but I understand the complexity. It's not always that simple, but still just a frustrating thing to always have to add that layer of complexity onto an already complex situation with trying to administer drugs for people who are dealing with cancer. But it sounds like your institution did some creative ways to give the best treatment possible for as many patients as possible while balancing what your supply was. So let's talk a little bit about not only who should administer intravesical treatments, but maybe we'll talk about like the settings that these types of treatments can be administered in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So oncology nurses that are trained in administering chemotherapy and in particular the intravesical chemotherapy should administer these treatments. So at my institution, all outpatient oncology RNs must obtain their ONS chemotherapy and immunotherapy provider card. And then in addition, any new outpatient oncology nurses that get hired in, they review education specifically on bladder installation and the different anti-cancer agents that are used and how to perform the procedure. And then they work with their preceptor and have to be checked off on a competency checklist as being competent before they can administer it independently or anything like that. So it's also seen and used after surgery. I mentioned before that a lot of patients get that TERPT procedure. It's very likely that the surgeon would be giving this bladder installation of treatment in the OR or possibly in the recovery room post-surgery. So generally, it's the physician administering it. And then at my institution, the OR and PACU nurses, they're trained specifically for this procedure and such as like safe handling, what to do if there's a chemo spill and proper disposal. So although they're not chemotherapy certified or hold a provider card, they are in the presence of these drugs for this very particular purpose, and they need to know how to keep themselves safe and others safe during that procedure. I've also heard too that these procedures could be done in private urology offices where there would be properly trained staff to assist in those procedures. Absolutely. And that's actually what I was just going to say is that I'm familiar with that being more often than not the case. You know, I'm in the Midwest and maybe that's depending on where you practice and kind of what is the norm for your region. But you're right. The important thing is that the nurses that are administering these anti-cancer agents are trained appropriately. And I think when we move into the settings that are physically outside of the oncology space, so our partners in urology, whether they're a hospital-affiliated department or they're a completely kind of standalone office, those nurses in that practice might not identify as really being an oncology nurse. And so I think it's important to stress why ONS still stands by our recommendation that registered nurses should be primary caregivers and administering this treatment based on not only the training that's required to do this safely, but you know, what we're going to talk about next, the assessment of these patients is so critical, both before and after they receive treatments. And it's the case for any anti-cancer agent in whatever route it's being administered. That assessment piece is critical to know that it's safe to proceed or that there are any issues that may have popped up in between treatments. And so that assessment piece is what really connects it and makes it important that a registered nurse is doing these types of treatments. And I also, again, just my own experience is BCG, in some people's eyes, that's not chemo, quote unquote, air quotes here. BCG is not chemo, but again, it's being given to help treat cancer and the, all of these, you know, the safety steps and things that we implement in our process to make sure that this is a safe procedure are critically important, even if it's technically speaking, it's a live virus and it's not a chemotherapy. So all those are things that are important and I'm glad you brought those things up. Let's move on to the, that next topic of assessment. So before performing, whether it's the first intravesical administration or it's the sixth, you know, the weekly dose or what have you, what are some of the specific assessments that oncology nurses should conduct to ensure that their patients can safely proceed with treatment that day? Yeah, so we definitely should be assessing the patient for any signs or symptoms of infection or for significant, persistent Irritative symptoms lingering from previous administrations, if they've had them before, like flu-like symptoms, painful and frequent urination, chills or fever. The oncology nurse should notify the physician if any of these types of symptoms are present. And my institution 
and it seems like it happens more often than not, we see patients' treatments getting held because they develop a UTI and then they need to get that taken care of and get on antibiotics before proceeding with the next part of their treatment regimen. And then, of course, after inserting the urinary catheter, we need to assess the urine. So the nurse should look for, is it clear? Is it free of clots? And if the urine is red, cloudy, or there's clots, we should really check with the physician and see if they want to do anything to check for infection and if it would be safe to proceed with the bladder installation at that time. And then also, so at my institution, the providers, they don't routinely order like a urinalysis, but some physicians may or some practices may order a urinalysis prior to every treatment or, you know, every so many treatments just to see, you know, what the lab values show. At our institution, it's more based on patients' reported symptoms and the look of the urine itself. And then also something to point out, so if the patient is going to be receiving BCG, the office may perform a TB skin test prior to, to make sure that the patient doesn't have a history of TB infection, because if the patient tests positive for TB, they may not be a candidate for the BCG bladder treatment. That's great. Those are some great things to be mindful of, especially prior to initiation of treatment. What about the symptoms or maybe even reactions that could occur during treatment? What should oncology nurses monitor for and when might they need to notify the ordering provider? So oncology nurses should notify the physician if the patient has any signs or symptoms of a UTI, they have a fever greater than 100.4, or any of those persistent symptoms that are lasting more than 24 to 48 hours, such as the flu-like symptoms, the clots in the urine, or any symptoms that are just getting worse or not getting better. And of course, it's always best to practice with a questioning attitude and put safety first. And if something doesn't seem right, always check with the provider first. So let's talk about best practices for oncology nurses to help ensure that they keep themselves safe during an intravesical administration. Oncology nurses are very well versed with PPE, and it's no different with the intravesical administration, if not a little more so, because there are risks of splashing or more potential risk of spill, leakage, splashing. So the oncology nurse definitely needs to wear their PPE, and that includes that chemotherapy approved gown the double chemotherapy tested gloves, and then either a shielded face mask or a mask and goggles for eye protection. And again, that face mask, shield, goggles, that's important because of that potential for splashing to protect the face. I have seen many questions come up on the ONS communities, even lately, about how to dispose of the urine or the catheter system after the bladder installation is completed. So probably every organization does it a little different, but some things that I wanted to share. So if the patient received BCG and if the department has a hopper, I don't even know if that's like the correct term. Like that's what I call it. I know what it means. (laughs) It's like that large toilet sink looking thing, like in your soiled utility room. Was it called a hopper? I don't know. That's what I was taught. I was thinking, I'm like, did I make that up? I don't know. Nope. I think you're right. (laughs) So if you have a hopper in your system, in your soiled utility room, and with BCG, so the BCG can actually be carefully drained into the hopper out of the Foley system. And then because it's that active bacteria, you're going to pour about an equal amount of bleach into the hopper, and then it sits for about 15 minutes to inactivate that live bacterium, and then the hopper can be flushed. So that's one way of doing it. Since the BCG is a biologic, then the catheter and supplies and anything else that was used should be disposed of in the red biohazard container. So if the department doesn't have a hopper at all, then the entire catheter system with the urine still in the bag would go inside of that red biohazard container. Then if it's chemotherapy, so we worked with pharmacy and we looked into like our state's EPA requirements. And it was determined that for chemotherapy, we're not going to drain it down the hopper. We're going to keep the entire system, if it's still in the urinary bag, keep it all closed in that urinary bag system and put the entire waste into a black bin. So that's how we kind of divided it out and decided. So really nothing in our institution goes into the yellow chemo bin when it comes to bladder installation. It's either the black bin if it's chemo or red bin if it's BCG. And if you have a hopper, you can dump it down the hopper. So that's how we do it at my institution. And then lastly, 
the room, of course, where the patient was treated needs to be cleaned. And if they did receive BCG, again, because of that live bacteria, we wipe the room down additionally with bleach wipes, wipe the bed and anything that the patient may have touched. We use the bleach wipes and then let the room sit for for a few minutes. And then housekeeping does their normal cleaning process. I think this is one of the most interesting parts of this type of chemotherapy administration is we are expecting to get essentially unmetabolized chemotherapy or, you know, BCG drained back out of that patient. And so, you know, we are expecting to have that technically direct exposure with the right PPE in place. Like you have mentioned, there are some different considerations to keep in mind. And as you said, working with your own institution's policy and procedure, your state or local requirements in terms of EPA and disposal, I think the red and the black bucket are pretty universal, but just check your own institution's color system of what do I put biohazardous waste instead of trace chemotherapy, which is typically that yellow bin, we're talking with bulk, like straight drug waste. So that's important to know that those are different quantities and they're treated differently in terms of disposal. So you did a great job of explaining your process. And I would encourage all the listeners just to review whatever your institution's policy is on that. And as you mentioned, pharmacy is a great resource because They also deal with bulk pharmaceutical waste as well. And so they'll be able to help guide in the right direction if you have questions. So let's talk a little bit about just some tips and tricks. So for oncology nurses, maybe they're starting out, you know, they're new to the process of intravesical administration. Do you have any tips or tricks for those nurses as far as the procedure goes? Yes, of course I do. So (laughs) I recommend definitely use like a waterproof chucks pad or something underneath the patient's bottom when you're inserting that catheter and then throughout the treatment, because there is potential for some leakage. Even if they have a catheter placed, there could be leakage around the catheter at times. So that will save you time and mess like for cleaning up if you have that pad there underneath the patient for help. So always do that. If the patient has issues or pain with the catheter insertion, a couple of tips and tricks for that. So Get an order for like a topical analgesic like lidocaine Eurojet to help ease the discomfort during the catheter insertion for the patient. And at my institution, it's actually automatically ordered like on all of our bladder installation patients in our EMR. It's just kind of a given as a pre-med, you know, quote unquote. And we use that before we insert the catheter. And then also if your institution permits it, a crude catheter. So at our institution, oh, a couple of years ago, they put in the policy that any RN that's been trained on it can insert a CUDE catheter on males. I think it's age 50 or older. Now it's not like with a stylet or anything like that. It's just a very simple product, but sometimes the CUDE catheter could be used to help for older males, maybe within large prostates that have difficulty with the catheter insertion. So a CUDE catheter could help with that. Now I will say it's hit or miss. I've heard some patients say that it's great. It really makes the insertion go much smoother. And other patients are like, no, it was worse. So you can't please everybody, I guess. So it's not going to work for everybody, but some an option to choose. And it happens. We have very challenging catheter insertions at times. And just the infusion nurse cannot get the catheter in for whatever reason. And so what we do is work with the urology office and those patients that are really difficult, they'll actually go to the urology office first and be placed, get the urinary catheter placed there. So I don't know if they use a stylet or what, or they're just more skilled at it, but they get the catheter placed. Then the patient comes over to us in the infusion center and gets their treatment. So it happens sometimes. Let's see what else. So if the patient complains of bladder spasms and, you know, that can happen with this type of treatment, you know, make sure you notify the physician because there are medications that can be prescribed to help with that. And then if anyone's having trouble visualizing the area when you're inserting a catheter, I had a nurse a few years ago and she's like, Tiff, I don't mind doing these bladder installations, but I have such a hard time seeing. And she said, especially for females, she's like, just the lighting in the room's not bright enough. And it's really difficult. So we tracked down one of those exam spotlights that's like on a stand and, you know, you can like move it, probably something you'd see maybe in like your OBGYN's office. We were able to track down one of those in our hospital's warehouse that wasn't being used and got to get it for free. And now we have it in our infusion center and the nurses can use it to help 
shed some more light when they're starting the catheter. Literally. Yeah. And it made a big difference. Now for that nurse, she's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Like all she needed was a little bit extra light. And it made that process of putting that catheter in so much better. You know, sometimes it's the little things. Those are great recommendations for sure. Of course, patient education is so important. And there are things that the patient can do to make it easier on themselves too. So like we said, they have to hold the urine in their bladder for up to two hours. And sometimes that can be very difficult. They can do some things to make that go a little smoother. So they can limit fluids for several hours before their appointment. They can avoid caffeine and like coffee and teas and pops and things like that. And also they should avoid taking any of their diuretics like Lasix until after the treatment. And then hopefully some of those avenues will help them be able to hold the urine in. I think those tips are great. And it really just for me highlights, it's obvious that this is different than IV administration, but some of the things that you can do to not only help make the procedure as comfortable as possible, but the reality is that it's kind of an uncomfortable insertion. Nobody wants, nobody likes to get a catheter. For anyone who's had it, you know, it's not enjoyable. And most of the time you only have to do it once for some sort of acute need, but this is something where a patient is coming in weekly at times and they know this is part of the process. And so all of these things that you can do to make that part of the procedure more comfortable for the patient, know what your resources are in terms of if you do have you know, a challenging catheter to start and you know that you have resources, whether it's another department or a certain equipment that can help make that insertion a little bit easier, not only for yourself, but for the patient who's having to experience it as well. Those are all some great tips to keep in mind as you get accustomed to this type of therapy. So naturally, I think patients will have some questions if they are being prescribed this treatment. As we started out, you know, people who go in, you know, they get their cancer diagnosis, they're told they have to get it, maybe a chemotherapy or some treatment. And everyone's mind will likely automatically assume it's some sort of IV treatment because that's just what we've been conditioned to expect chemotherapy to mean. But it's very different. And so what are some key discussion points that you can recommend oncology nurses use as they educate their patients and review with their patients kind of what to expect when they come in for their therapy? Well, definitely. And like you said, it is very different than IV treatment. So it needs to be clear that it's not IV treatment. And it's sad to say, but we've had patients come into our infusion centers before and have no idea that they were getting a catheter placed, like no idea. And it's like, okay, there was definitely a communication breakdown or lack of something. Well, and even if you say catheter, like maybe they think it's an IV catheter right. and not like a blood, you know, so it just it makes sure the language, the words that you use and being clear seems very important. Yes, exactly. And so it is so important to make sure you're assessing the patients and where they're at in their learning needs and their educational level and, you know, what they can comprehend and make sure they understand. They need to know they're getting a urinary catheter <laughs> into the bladder and not an IV. So that's like super ground one. But of course, there's many other things that they're going to need educated on. So of course, like what to do at home after treatment. There's lots of things and I'll list these quickly, but you know, we encourage them to drink large amounts of liquid to flush the bladder once the treatment is completed for the day, empty their bladder frequently, you know, and men should sit instead of stand to urinate to avoid splashing. And we say that for six hours after treatment. And then for BCG in particular, again, since it's that live bacterium, after urinating each time for six hours after treatment, the patient or a, you know, a caregiver should pour about two cups of household bleach into the toilet and let it sit for 15 minutes. So like the same thing we did in the hopper in the hospital, they would do similar at home and then you know cover the toilet and flush it once or twice. And if it's chemotherapy and not the BCG, you don't have to use bleach, but then it's also good to cover and flush the toilet once or twice after each void for six hours. And then of course, if they urinate or they're incontinent or have leakage or a problem, they should remove clothes if it's contaminated with that urine and wash them separately from other clothing. If they get any urine or anything on their skin, they want to make sure they wash it right away with soap and water because that area could get irritated. They should always wash their hands thoroughly after they urinate. Wear gloves if they're cleaning up your, a urine spill or incontinent or something like that. And of course, the patient or the patient's loved one should avoid getting pregnant. It's recommended to wear a condom during intercourse until therapy is completed and really should avoid intercourse altogether for 24 hours after each treatment. And then of course, the patients need to know what side effects to look out for. So you want to make sure they know the painful or difficult urination 
urgency, frequency, some blood in the urine. And all that's common. That's normal. It's normal to have some of those side effects right away. It's just if they continue or don't get better, that's when they'd want to notify the doctor. And then with BCG, they could have some mild flu-like symptoms or a low-grade fever, and you can instruct them to take some acetaminophen or something like that to help with that. They need to know when to call the physician to have that list of this is when you need to call the doctor. And so, of course, a fever greater than 100.4 or any persistent symptoms that last more than 24 to 48 hours, such as those flu-like symptoms or clots in the urine or just any symptoms that are getting worse and they're not getting better. So we use Epic at my institution as our EMR, and I've created some smart phrases of this patient education that I just like quickly blurted out and have it all, you know, nice typed out. And so it's as a smart phrase, and then the nurse can quickly just pull that into our discharge instructions or our after visit summary and have that printed out for the patient. So that's something that we use and give to our patients at their first visit when they come in and then every visit if they need it or have more questions on what to do. Because it is a lot. It's a lot they have to remember and it's a lot they have to do to stuff you just never think about. It's like, you just need to go to the bathroom. Well, now you got to do this, 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 and this. You know, that can be a lot on a patient and their family. And so patient education is so important and it really starts at the provider's office. So unfortunately, I think sometimes the education provided isn't very thorough or the patient and family, they just don't understand what they're being told. And that's something that my institution is really working hard on. We have an oncology nurse navigator and she focuses on urology. And this is a newer role for our system. And she's been in it for about two years. She's doing a phenomenal job. She's actually currently working with marketing to create like an easy to understand patient education handout that the urology offices can use to educate their patients on their bladder cancer and on their bladder installation treatment so that they will be maybe a little more prepared before they come to the infusion center and already have some information and education on hand. Those are amazing ideas. And you bring up some great points that every office, every location is strapped for time. And so, and sometimes there's just too much information to share with a patient at the end of a 20 minute follow-up visit or, and even if we could get it all in, would they be able to absorb it anyway? So the notion of patient education and it being a one and done concept is certainly not what most patients need. They need it to be given in small doses, reinforced and repeated at different locations. And as we talked about earlier, for urology offices who perhaps have nurses on staff, but aren't familiar with the therapeutic side of it because they don't administer it in office, then they might not feel like they are, are equipped to give that education. So just understanding where your patients are coming from, like literally where are they coming from <laughs> to the infusion center to get this treatment performed? What information are they coming with? And then how can you best support them either before or once they arrive? So many of our centers, I think we do have kind of standard like new treatment packets or new treatment bundles of like someone's about to start chemotherapy. But for patients who are maybe only getting intravesical administration of BCG, or even if it's of a chemotherapy, a lot of that content's not going to apply the right way because of that change. It's not being systemically absorbed usually to a level that you're going to have the, you know, the myelosuppression or the nausea and vomiting, things like that. And so I would just encourage everyone, just be very mindful of the education materials that you're giving to your patients if they are only getting this type of treatment so that you don't give them the wrong information and, and perhaps make them have the wrong idea or wrong expectation of what their experience is going to be like. And it sounds like, as you mentioned, Tiffany, those smart phrases, kind of creating those own those materials that really meet the needs of this specific and unique patient population can help make that a little bit more efficient. All right. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing all of your great knowledge and wisdom with us today on this experience. I think it's something that a lot of oncology nurses, if you've never done it, then it feels very mysterious and kind of nebulous. And so you've done a great job, I think, of just walking us through the process and what to expect and how to best care for our patients as they go through this therapy. So as we finish out today's episodes, I always like to ask a few wrap-up questions. So to start that out, what are some common misconceptions about intravesical administration? What I want to say is these patients, even though they're not getting IV chemotherapy, they still have a cancer diagnosis, and that can still be very scary and unsettling. And I think sometimes, you know, you think, oh, these are just bladder patients. It's different. But 
it might not be different. Again, they still have a cancer diagnosis. This is still going to be a very fearful and unsettling time for that patient and their caregivers. And so just to remind all oncology nurses out there that we should treat these patients the same as we treat any of our other patients that might be getting IV or oral chemotherapy. I love that. And again, back to the urology notion, we know we partner with that specialty for this diagnosis, but if that patient maybe isn't aligned with a medical oncologist, they're kind of missing that step and that perhaps introduction to what it means to have a cancer diagnosis and and how we treat things. Those are some great words of advice to just consider that as a nurse, you might be their first specialist that deals with cancer specifically. And so just take the time to walk them through that process as well. What's the topic that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? We as oncology nurses, and I think we do an excellent job in patient care, but something that doesn't hurt to be a reminder And we need to pay extra attention to protecting these patients' privacy. These patients are having a urinary catheter inserted that isn't pleasant and it's very private. So we really need to be mindful of that. And I want to share, we actually, gosh, it was only a couple of weeks ago that I received some feedback from a bladder installation patient that he wanted to share with me that when he came in for his treatment, we did not meet his expectations. You know, and that's terrible to hear as a manager We want to provide the best care possible to every single patient, but I was able to turn this into a learning moment and I'm sharing it here with you now. He shared a couple of things and it involved his privacy. The first thing was he said at one point when the nurse, you know, left the room that she didn't pull the curtain or close the door or offer to pull the curtain or close the door. You know, that was very unsettling to him. You know, he At this point, he already had the catheter inserted and, you know, I don't know if he was doing his turns, but, you know, that's not something that you want other people walking by and looking in and seeing you laying there or rolling around in the bed. So it did not meet his expectations of his care. And that's something we definitely can do better. And so I tell my staff and not just these patients, every patient, but especially our bladder installation patients, that we really need to be careful of protecting their privacy offering to close doors or pull curtains and those kind of things so that they can have that privacy if they need it and if they want it. The other thing he had to say was that nurse was training another nurse. And so she introduced the other nurse. Hey, here's the other nurse. She's going to be working with me today, which happens all the time, right? Well, in his perception, he felt that the primary nurse should have asked his permission for the secondary nurse to be a part of his care. And I don't know if we always do that, but I think that that was a good example of how different patients have different perspectives and perceptions and what they think or how we're providing their care. So I think it's a good example too, to think of, hey, if I got a student with me today, or I'm precepting a new nurse or someone shadowing from a different floor or whatever, that, you know, maybe instead of just introducing the patient, also extending that, are you okay if they're part of your care today? And I think if we would have asked that, he would have said, yeah, fine. It was just a thought that we didn't ask. So with all patients, but especially these bladder patients that were being very mindful of protecting their privacy because it is such a a private procedure. Those are some great recommendations. And I especially like the reminder of just asking the patient if it's okay to invite, whether it's a, obviously if it's a nurse who's been hired and is training as a, you know, you're precepting that not necessarily negotiable, but you know, it probably feels different if it's a student versus another nurse who's fully licensed and prepared. But still, there's always the importance of just introducing who's with you and what the importance is of them being part of the care and asking that permission. The patient's having a really hard day, regardless of what their diagnosis or their treatment is, they might just not have it in them to deal with somebody who's new or unfamiliar. And so we just always need to extend that request to patients and be the ones let them be the ones to you know, guide us on what they're willing and ready to accommodate at that day's treatment. So great wisdom beyond even our topic today. What's additional training or education that oncology nurses need to better understand and conduct intravesical administration? So oncology nurses should follow their organization's policies and training procedures. And like I said before, at my center, the nurse must hold the ONS chemotherapy immunotherapy provider card and be checked off as competent to perform intravesical therapy in our system. Perfect. And are there any additional resources for patients or providers, clinicians who want to learn more? Yes, of course. So the 
ONS chemotherapy and immunotherapy guidelines for practice. I call it my infusion Bible. I keep all of our outpatient oncology policies and procedures up to date. And that's like my number one resource is to use that book. And there is a small section in there that does discuss intravesical administration. It's just, I don't know, it might only be like two, two and a half pages. So it's not a whole lot, but there is a little bit in there. And that's what I used when I first formulated our policies. And then I did want to mention, so I was looking through the podcasts and I've been listening to lots of them now and it's great. And it's so easy to listen to these podcasts and learn as you're driving to and from work or cleaning the house or whatever. I love them. And then getting the credits is is fabulous. But there is one, there's a nursing podcast from ONS. It was back in 2020. It's episode 114 and it's Clara Beavers, clinical nurse specialist at Carmanos Cancer Institute in Detroit, Michigan. And she mentioned a procedure that her institute uses, and she mentioned that it's noted in the ONS Safe Handling of Hazardous Drugs Manual. So she came up with their own closed system where they use, it sounds like, so my institution, we use a syringe with the drug in it and instill it into the side port of the catheter. Well, they came up with like their own system using a bag and like tubing to I think it sounds like by gravity, have the medication instilled and that goes slower in and reduces the risk of bladder spasms and things like that. So if anyone's interested to learn more, I recommend listening to her podcast, episode 114. And then of course, I need to get my hands on the ONS safe handling book and look it up for myself too. (laughs) Because I've never seen that method. We've always done the push. So I want to see that. And then my biggest plug, I guess, is the ONS community's discussion posts. I love the discussion post. I regularly post questions on there. I answer questions. I actually emailed two people today from that. I sign up for the daily digest. And so every morning when I wake up, so I check my phone. Did anyone call off? No, fabulous. And then I check my email. And the first thing I go to is my ONS discussion, the communities. And I kind of peruse through like what questions are on there. If there's something like, oh yeah. And I'll like quick fire like an answer, probably almost unable to read it. My glasses aren't on. It's still dark and it's, you know, I do my best, but answer those questions. And there is tons of information about bladder installation on there. Lots of people posting questions and posting answers about processes and procedures and education. There is so much you can find and you can go to the discussion and do a search and find almost anything in there. But in particular, if you wanted to look for more information on this bladder installation, you can find tons of stuff in the ONS communities. I love it. And I agree. I think especially some of these types of questions that, you know, you just want to hear how are other people doing it or are we're having this challenge? Are you guys having it? How did you address it? It's just a great place to share with not only just local colleagues, but across the country, potentially across the world. I mean, it could be anywhere. And so it's just a great place to learn and just get tips and tricks from others that have done it. So I love that you found them and you love them and think they're useful. And as you said, it could be on a variety of topics. It's just a great place to kind of get that question out there and see what other people think. Tiffany, it's been so fun talking about this with you and hearing all of your expertise. Do you have any final comments to share with our listeners today? Well, I just want to say thank you for having me. And I love ONS and everything you guys do to promote oncology nursing and educating us. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part in this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guest and not necessarily ONS.